Hello, welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon. That was Miami Vice. This week, we're talking about Season 5, Episode 13, titled The Cell Within. Quality name for an episode, by the way. So far, this season has been kind of hit and miss on, on names. This one? Perfect. <laughs> Spot on to the episode. <laughs> Definitely made me think of like the Jennifer Lopez, The Cell movie. Mm, Definitely a plus. Mm-hmm. It originally premiered on March 10th, 1989. It is written by Jack Richardson, who also wrote Honor Among Thieves. Eh, he's got one more coming. <laughs> it's a glowing review. Was it you. written <laughs> by L.M. Kit Carson? <laughs> no. And it is directed by Michael Hogan, who wrote French Twist. Oh. This is the only episode that he directed. <laughs> well, <laughs> good for <laughs> him. <laughs> He tried. He did so a thing. The, the people that wrote and directed this also did Honor Among Thieves and French Twist. So you <laughs> put those two together, you get <laughs> the cell within. <laughs> Before we can start, I can check in soon each other's lives. Pals, we want to wish you a happy holidays, a Merry Christmas, a happy Festivus that happened just yesterday as this episode lands on Christmas Eve. So if you're spending some time on Christmas Day listening to us, we thank you so much for inviting us into your family on Christmas Day. We also would be remiss if we didn't mention, not Christmas, whatever, on December 15th was Don Johnson's 69th birthday. The important dates in this in this house. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't look a day over 60. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm joking. He looks phenomenal. I have phenomenal. a feeling he's turned 69 a few times, a few different <laughs> birthdays. He looks amazing. I'm just saying it. You look great, Don. Don't change a thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we just want to wish everyone a happy holidays. Merry Christmas. Happy Festivus. Happy birthday to Don Johnson. Whatever it is that you're celebrating today, we want to hope that you have a very fantastic day. And that uh, we really appreciate you appreciating that day with us in your ears on that day. Let's talk about this week's episode and the um, cultish <laughs> behavior of our primary host throughout the most of the episode. Let's go break this one down. I'm so excited to talk about Yanni. I can't concentrate. <laughs> you just keep thinking about Yanni. <laughs> Yanni. Oh. <laughs> When we open up, we're at the ultimate underground, seedy underbelly of Miami. Not Hooker Row, which we normally start off. This is a great scenery that we have set up. And I don't know where this is. Not just fire in trash cans, but fire like shooting out of trash cans <laughs> in like a Slayer performance underneath the overpass. My guess is this is the back store. <laughs> There's a man selling drugs, and this is the best drug deal ever. I mean, this is the best service. He pulls up. He's like, crack, please. <laughs> he's like, no, he got it. And then he drives away. And that's it. And right, it was transaction. a very polite transaction also. <laughs> I wish buying crack was always like that. <laughs> crack me, please. <laughs> it's usually much more difficult. <laughs> Another man comes up and asks if he's dealing. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, of course I am. And he's like, well, this other man in a limo wants to talk to you. You should go over and talk to him. He wants to buy. So Eddie says, all right, fine. Let's go walk over there. And then his escort kind of ditches him halfway through the walk. And he's left alone to go approach. And you can see he's really nervous. He pulls out his knife, changes his mind at the last oh. minute before walking up to the limo. But but when he first goes around, the limo's gone. And then it appears behind him magically. So like it's a ghost limo, guys. Like this is <laughs> super spooky. <laughs> he comes walking up and he looks in the window and there's no one in there and then he has a chance to turn around just in time Ghost limo blammo <laughs> right in the face and eddie goes down and then the man that punched him picks him up and kidnaps him leaving his drugs and money on the ground you take the drugs and money come all on. the good stuff <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> meanwhile at a bookstore across town somewhere a man is introducing a filmmaker named robert Phelps. Phelps then introduces the author of a book named Jake, Jake Manning. It's just introduction after introduction here tonight. Yeah, he's like, he's the cool guy. I just made someone on TV. Introduction to introduction. Apparently, Tubbs is a big fan of this guy. We find out through the conversation that Tubbs had arrested Jake because Jake's like signing books and he's done a movie and TV deal with Phelps. But we find out that Tubbs had arrested him. He had put him in jail for a long time. The man was very bitter at Tubbs and hated him. And But now he realizes that he's helped get him to this position. 
and had personally invited him to show up to this book signing. I I didn't get that at all. I don't think he hated him one bit. He says that he thought about him all the time in prison, especially in the shower. (laughs) So I think this is a sweet thing to ask him to come to dinner. Okay, but didn't this guy kill people? Yes. So how did he get out? (laughs) We find out later that Phelps is like vouching for him after he's done all those interviews and the letter exchanges. That's what we find in the conversation with Phelps that they had been exchanging letters with each other and Phelps had fallen in love with the cell within his brain of like how he saw himself and what was wrong with him and the, the kind of mental struggles he was going through. Yeah. See, that's it's the beginning of our love triangle. <laughs> I hate anyone who would hate Tubbs, though. And, and and Jake, you had me on the fence very early here because anyone who hates Tubbs, I hate them. Tubbs is a lover and a gentleman. And they're meanies. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, by the end of the episode, you're going to realize that Jake loves Tubbs and that the feeling is actually a little bit reciprocated. <laughs> Tubbs is here to help those who need it and slap the ones who refuse. Those chumps. Yeah. <laughs> So now we have our new best friends. And then we go to the opening credits. Before we move on, this is our chance to check in with the guest stars. John, what do you got for this week? Because I don't recognize anybody. Well, I mean, there's no gigantic names. We're not going to get any John Leguizamos or Ving Rames in this one. Let's start with John P. Ryan. He plays Jake Manning. He's a character actor known for being cast in like dark brooding roles and more of a bad guy. He's known for his role as Warden Rankin in the 1985 film Runaway Train. His first movie appearance was in 1967, The Tiger Makes Out. Some of his other movies, a few other big blockbusters, It's Alive and It's Alive sequel, It Lives Again. <laughs> blockbusters he was in some fantastic movies have you ever seen he was in future world oh i love i actually have seen future world that is a so bad it's good kind of movie i mean it did an all bad sci-fi movie he was also in hoffa yeah that's a good movie and he was in the right stuff which if it's the movie i'm thinking of not that bad (laughs) i like how you're like if if it's the movie i think it is i'm not sure I've been fooled before. So his final appearance in the movie Bound in 96, as far as the TV side, dude showed up in pretty much every 70s cop show. Unfortunately, John P. Ryan passed away at the age of 70 in 2007 of a stroke. So our next guest star is Robin Bartlett. She plays Rhoda King. Shows up in some more notable movies, like her most recent movie, she was in Shutter Island. Hmm. Other movies, she was in Moonstruck, played Milliot, the teacher, and Lean On Me. Oh, weird. Weird. Okay, the reason why I say that is because the number one movie in theaters when this episode came out is Lean On Me, starring Morgan Freeman. Mm -hmm. She also uh, showed up in Sophie's Choice regarding Henry. Probably the best movie on this list, Honey, We Shrunk Ourselves, which is the (laughs) sequel. That's right. I'm putting it above Sophie's Choice. (laughs) All right. All joking aside, on the TV side, she did 21 episodes of some show called The Powers to Be. That, That was from 92 to 93. She showed up in 28 episodes of Mad About You. Which I didn't realize Matt you actually went all the way until 99. She was also in six episodes of Dragnet, so there's your Michael Mann connection. Our next guest star is Maria Pillow, plays Anna. She got her start first doing TV commercials. Like, I think she did a uh, Pepto-Bismol commercial. I um, wonder if it was the... Uh, I wonder if she was like the one with diarrhea or the Upset one like, after the diarrhea. diarrhea. <laughs> <laughs> she would go on from TV commercials to getting a part on the soap opera Ryan's Hope from 87 to 89. That wouldn't be her only regular TV show. She would also do t- 31 episodes of Providence. She's actually been in some, some decent movies, Natural Born Killers, Chaplin, and Wise Guys. What she's probably more known for is probably the role she doesn't want to be known for. She played Audrey Timmons in 1998's version of Godzilla. Oh, uh, uh, th- that's the Matthew Broderick one. Mm. That role earned her a golden raspberry for worst supporting actress. <laughs> All that aside, she actually retired from acting in 06, and now she runs a small business with her husband. And our next guest star is Richard Gant. He played Battle and Barry Gay. So he got his art 
in the uh, 1980 TV movie Attica. Some of his other bigger roles were Rocky V, where he played Don King type guy, the George Washington Duke. He also played a possessed coroner in Jason Goes to Hell, The Final Friday. Now that we can talk about. <laughs> he was an older cop in The Big Lebowski. He played Abba Ak in CB4. The same with Maria Pillow as the Golden Raspberry. He was Admiral Phelps in the 98 Godzilla. Oh, so weird. They both they would work together. Yeah, yeah. He was also fantastic as the preacher in Norbit out there. <laughs> So he was in a bunch of TV movies, and just a few guest appearances in shows like Smallville. But what caught my attention as far as TV with Richard Gant was uh, he starred in an unaired TV pilot called Revenge of the Nerds in 1991. So that means yeah. that in 91, they almost came out with a Revenge of the Nerds TV show. And my thought is, could I have grown up on Revenge of the Nerds TV show instead of Saved by the Bell? Like, is that... I was just about to say we might have room to do one now, and I realized like, oh yeah, no, that's Silicon Valley. That's that's basically Revenge of the Nerds. That show. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> okay, so our final guest star is L. M. Kit Carson, who plays Robert Phelps. This was his only TV appearance. He's been in a few movies. You may have heard of Hurricane Streets. 97. If you haven't, you've probably heard of it. It had Morgan J. Freeman in it. <laughs> Are you sure this Morgan J. Porn? Freeman. Not not the other Morgan. Not, not, not <laughs> the Morgan Freeman. Morgan J. Okay. Freeman. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, if, if you don't know that, you might know some of the movies he's written. So he wrote something called Paris, Texas in 84, which starred his son, Hunter. Paris, no, I might actually know one? that. That's no. actually it did get some uh, quite a bit of buzz as far as the indie crowd goes. So, but I didn't look too far into it because it started Sun Hunter. So I just kind of <laughs> assumed. Like it's bad now. <laughs> All right, I, I'm gonna be dead honest. L. M. Kit Carson, biggest movie he ever wrote, and what he's probably what he's most notable for. He wrote Texas. Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. Oh, wow. Mm. I, I looked at everything. I looked, yeah, he acted in some movies. He wrote some other movies. Now, he's going to be known for Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. <laughs> and them's your guesters. Quick check on that movie, Paris, Texas. It won the Palme d'Or at the Cannes Film Festival in 1984. It's got Harry Dean Stanton I in was, it. And Sam Shepard. Yeah. Was you're looking at it. It's like, so it's got, some, it's got mm. a big cast. It's a legit movie. Yeah. When we come back from the opening credits, we're at the precinct. Tubbs hangs up his phone and starts talking to Sonny. Sonny is skeptical that Jake has reformed, as is everyone nah, in the he's precinct cool. he's except just an for Tubbs. No one else thinks that Jake is reformed. Tubbs is the only one trying to look at this through rose-colored glasses here. Tubbs says that he's been reading his book. He's really educated himself as far as Jake has behind bars. He's really smart. And Sonny's like, yeah, yeah, whatever. I'm going on vacation. See you later. He's got Sion on his way out. It's like, thanks to the fishing pole for Timmy. I mean, Billy. And then he's Stewie. gone. And we don't see him Bonnie. for the rest of the episode. Because Sion stops to talk to Tubbs and he tells him that, hey, Jake is dangerous. He killed two people. You put him in jail. Go armed. Yeah. He tells him not to go. Well, well, first yeah. of all. Dad also says, Dad also says he, he's suspected of killing more than two people. Like, he only did time for killing two people. They thought he killed more than two people. Tubbs' reaction is great. He's like, oh, he didn't mention it in his book at all. Like, I read this thing <laughs> cover to cover. Dad just says, make sure you go armed. Now get out of here, you little scamp. <laughs> Down at the docks, then that night, Tubbs is waiting for his ride out to the house. Tubbs, you are a police officer. Shouldn't there be red sirens flashing say. everywhere? You have to wait <laughs> at the docks. Another man comes up and gets you. You guys get in a boat, and then you go out to his house on an island. Yeah. This is like some Dr. Moreau shit. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, but this is this is constant in Miami Vice. How many times have we met like a drug dealer or mob boss where you've got to take a boat to their bigger boat or their mansion <laughs> on an island? Like, how many islands do these drug kingpins own out there in Miami? That's what I'm saying, too. It's like Tubbs deals with this all the time. He should know better. This is going into danger land. This isn't Disneyland. I think He's we going might to even this land. island. <laughs> isn't He's... this the man where Sonny killed Hackman? <laughs> He's reformed, you guys. Reformed. He wrote a book about it. Mm. He cannot kill people I, I, now. I, I love Tubbs interacting with the... Because he sends the boxer battling Barry Gay to go pick up Tubbs. And I love... 
<laughs> Love Tubs like, hey, weren't you somebody once? Yeah, some kind of like, half ass boxer. Like, completely just kind of kicks dirt on him. I saw you fight once. Yeah, you lost. I feel bad for Barry this entire episode. Yes. We're going to get to when I feel the saddest for him. Because they pull up to the house and it is huge. How does this man who's just gotten out of jail have this big of a house, a personal servant on his own island? Warning, Tubbs. <laughs> yeah. Warning. He, he deal because the last guy was killed. Some guy named Hackman. <laughs> Barry says that he met Jake in prison and that they were cellmates. Warning. Mm -hmm. Warning. Inside, he goes and meets with Jake. Jake is very happy to see him. They're very happy to see each other. It's a very amicable relationship. They're both dressed very this is nice. A date. Yep, it's a date. <laughs> this is a date. Then Tubbs and Jake go sit in the parlor and chat about books and stuff like that. And Jake turns to Barry and says, you're dismissed. And then turns to Tubbs and says, it's okay. He took a few too many left hooks to the head. And, and they then, both laugh. <laughs> and Barry goes on, oh, gets this sad face. And he walks away all sad. Yeah, and Tubbs like laugh, puts his arm around the guy like, ah, it's so funny. He's like, oh, ouch. Barry, kill them all. Yeah, just kill them all. I'm pulling for you, Barry. Yes. <laughs> You gotta love the hey, Barry go mind the boats move. This might get a little X rated. <laughs> this might get a little too analytical for you. You gotta go. I might hurt your brain if you listen to this conversation. <laughs> Date starts off well, apparently. And then it starts going like really, really creepy. Now he's can I show you something? Can I show you some pictures I took? And like I'm expecting him new pictures of Manning. Yeah. <laughs> How do you think I look in this nighty tubs? <laughs> he hits a button and this painting goes rolling up into the ceiling. Again, this gigantic house. That's the biggest, most expensive house that we've ever seen in yeah. Vice. There's these TVs behind the painting. He starts showing him videos of what he considers to be what's wrong with modern society. A burlesque show. You have some people, like a video of people fighting on the street, right? Yeah. And then, and then it's like, all the instant guy, replay's fault. And then, and then there's a guy who's like a drug dealer. There's like a picture of him with a cell phone and like a girl next yeah, to him. Yeah, he, he deals with like sex magazines and stuff like yeah. that too. Jason Lane. Jason Lane is a pornographer and humanitarian. He's a great man. <laughs> Making the world a better place. <laughs> Every pornographer is a humanitarian, really. I mean, He's a giver. <laughs> Jake tells Tubbs that the whole world's going crazy. The normal person is becoming a sociopath. And Tubbs is like, yeah, I kind of agree with you. Yeah, yeah, he's just going with it because he's like afraid. He's like, okay, I I, he starts to feel like this is kind of weird now. So this is the point date where I'm pretty sure Manning is about to give Tubbs the safe word. <laughs> Tubbs says a phrase that his mom used to tell him all the time, which is keep your nose clean. And eventually you'll get your reward. Nowadays, they'd call you a chump. A loser. Well, that's so, what they call you, Tubbs. <laughs> <laughs> but Tubbs is kind of buying into it. Like, you're right. There's something wrong with society. Things aren't the same as they were when we were kids. Kind of sounds like talking to boomers. They talk about millennials. <laughs> and this was, you know, pre-boomers mm -hmm. talking about boomers. Anyways. You just had you to know, throw that in there, didn't you? Ge generational things. It's as though old people see young people always the same. It's just, you know. And that they become old, they become bitter husks of human beings and like to take their rage <laughs> nah, out of like young nah, people. Nah, baby. Can't you see? Everything's changing. Now finish <laughs> your drink. I put a roofie in there. <laughs> and Jake starts Which talking about... Which is actually about what I thought, but then they hit him with the dart and it's like, pff, left turn. Like, I didn't see that one coming. <laughs> well, Jake starts telling him, we have to take it into our own hands. And that's when Tubbs like, like, oh, okay. okay. So it's looking at his watch like... Time Maybe we should get to that party. Are we supposed to have a party? Jake says, there's no party. It's you just me and you. We, we never would have taken my invitation if you knew it was just a one-on-one -on -one dinner meeting. And he's like, why did you tell me there was a party? All disappointed. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Where's the party? <laughs> there's going to be a party. There's going to be a party in your pants. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to go with butt, but pants, butt, same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Tubbs gets up to leave, and that's when Barry hits him with the dart. <laughs> Blammo, right in the. <laughs> <laughs> See, they, they make fun of Barry like he's some simpleton. He's got skills, man. How many people can use those dart guns like that accurately? <laughs> <laughs> Tubbs wakes up in a cell, and Jake waking him up over a loudspeaker says, This cell is the exact cell, an exact replica of the cell that I was in when I was in jail. And I want you to feel how. I felt in jail. 
Go ahead and look in the toilet. Would you like to play? <laughs> that same dump I took the last time I was there, I kept it for you. <laughs> At the precinct, Castillo's talking to the ladies. Rico's missing. They called his house. Nothing. Stan says maybe he got lucky. Castillo says, no, that's not possible. <laughs> Ouch. Also, he's never late. I like the rest of you lazy assholes. Yeah. He always shows up on time. Yeah. Sunny. <laughs> so he's not even I love there. that the, I love that I'm not the only one that thought that this was a date. Like so I text like, well, maybe he got lucky. He said maybe he met one of those literary types and then because he was like, no. <laughs> you could see the love in Tub's eye. So apparently they don't know where Jake lives. No. They have no idea where this gigantic house is. They have no idea where Tubbs was going. Although they knew last week where Sonny was when they were at <laughs> yes. Jack's house. He was squatting in. Just saying. Just the difference is they don't care about Tubbs, okay? They didn't care about Tubbs. Like, eh, he'll be all right. <laughs> so they don't know where he is. And apparently they have nothing going on. There is no crime in the city right now. <laughs> They're all just kind of sitting around bored, and they're like, hey, where's Tubbs? Where's our buddy Tubbs? Maybe we should go help him, you know? Last time we saw him, he was going on a date. This is unlike him. Gina says maybe we get the information from Phelps, that movie director, that helped get Jake out on parole, so that they're really close. They have some TV deal together, too. And Cassio says, okay, fine. Stan's going to help me. Ladies, you go follow up on Phelps. Back at Jake's, Jake's in his fanciest cult clothes. <laughs> Nice. Fancy robes. Yeah, nice robes with a sash. Oh, little yeah. emblem. They have like their own emblem, too, that's like used to hold the sash. Anyways, choice materials that he Starting used to, for this. Oh, yeah. So he's got the whole costume worked out. And then now we're going to get this like really nice tour of his sex dungeon. <laughs> he does take a lot of tour. He takes it up and shows him Jackson, who is like a professional hitman. Question mark. I don't know what they're trying to get at for what he did. He says that he kills people professionally, then the ineptitude of the legal system put him back out on the street. Funny story. He hired he almost hired him once to kill Tubbs. Tubbs is wily though. Can't get him. <laughs> He's too busy sweating it up with his Yeah, feet. no, I thought that was great that he had, that that was like the commentary like, like meet so and so. Like at the very end, he was like, I almost hired him to kill you one day. Well, one time. They stop and look at another woman. She's a whore as they <laughs> kind of phrase it in the episode and he says that she abuses her god-given abilities and that she had propositioned him so he locked her up tub says she's just a kid how like she's young why are you doing this to her and tubs is finally starting to put up a little bit of a fight and then they get to eddie they talk to the drug dealer who was in the very beginning where he got taken by barry so i'm thinking the crackhead was probably the hardest catch because they're kind of wily you know they move quick <laughs> they got extra strength too <laughs> hard to nail them down the horror probably was easy that probably just took like a 20 dollar bill and like some string well he's got the dart so he could dart her from far away <laughs> dangle that 20 Very and shoot a dart right at her Very <laughs> true. before they leave from eddie they close the door and they say that he's sorry jake says they always have an excuse there's always some reason why it's not their fault and then they get to the psychiatrist yeah so this the is psychiatrist was the only one that like i didn't expect to go okay um now we've gone from actual crimes to she told it, she told me it was my mommy's fault <laughs> it's the actual prison psychiatrist from where he served he tries to play it off as the psychiatrist always wants to blame something else for the person who's doing the crimes like it's their childhood it's their upbringing it's their whatever it doesn't make them take cre not credit but take fault in their own actions. responsibility so, yeah there you go that's what i was looking for she tries to talk her way out and jake flips out slams the door on her and yells and says this time that it's time for discussion calm. is over she stays amazingly calm which is very weird locked in a sex dungeon <laughs> she is amazingly chill throughout the entire episode nothing faces amazingly her. chill until tubbs tries to reassure her and then she just flips <laughs> flips out yeah that's insane until they try he starts telling her they're gonna electrocute her then she's like no god no wait no i'm so sorry she like begs him gets on her hands and knees and begs him meanwhile so, by the way this has got to be the weirdest date ever like i'm pretty sure next time tubbs is gonna swipe left instead of right here <laughs> Meanwhile, Castillo is stopping off over at Phelps' place. He's editing videos and it's interview videos with Jake. And in the videos, you hear Jake's talking about, there's something wrong with me. It feels like there's a blackness inside of me. I can't fight it. I'm coming apart. Pause. 
Because Seal's like, what's up, pal? Yeah, he's like just hanging out in the back, like creepily. <laughs> Like waiting for him to notice he's there. <laughs> hey, how you doing? <laughs> you know, and and he reluctantly gets the or some address from from the producer. But when he gives it to him, he gives it to him. And he's like, eh, you know, like if it's a rock, don't go and knock it. Weird. <laughs> so I want to pause for a second on this episode and talk about the things that they have covered so far in this and how dark this episode really is. And it's not dark as in. Like, say, with Baby Tubbs. That's a very dark episode because in the end, he thinks that he's lost his son. Well, he has, but he's yeah. not dead. This episode is talking about very dark subject matter. We have, obviously, we have prostitution. We have kidnapping. We have cults. We have a, an assassin, I guess. I'm assuming that that's what they're trying to get at. That yeah. There wasn't, some, there wasn't some hidden meaning to be like a lawyer or something like that. Um, they, and then prison psychiatrist. And it's really honing in on are people able to be reformed? Everything that Jake is associated with and all of the people that he's talking about, that they have to go because their crimes against society are so bad and that they are unable to be reformed. A drug addict, a prostitute, a killer. And then the psychiatrist who makes excuses for all of them. So he's he's saying it's impossible for people to be reformed. And that's where the really that the darkness of this episode really comes in. So now back at Jake's Tubbs is chilling. He hears Jackson yelling, the man, the first man in the in the prison. And then this rolling door like opens up and Tubbs can see through a window into a cell that has that up full-blown electric chair and jackson is strapped down all out inside in the of sex there. dungeon <laughs> that must have cost so much i can't imagine what his energy bill is too <laughs> i mean yeah there's so many electrocutions all day long <laughs> every friday this guy goes through like a hundred kilowatts i don't know how <laughs> jake is in there different cult clothes he's got jackson strapped down inside of the chair he says to rico the time is now for action and he flips the switch and electrocutes jackson he's dead he kills him right there in front in front of tubs and tubs has nothing to do but watch well, i guess he didn't have to watch so, it, and then, <laughs> he could have closed his eyes i mean uh. well and then he makes a comment like it, like this wasn't even the first time he's done this i think he's been electrocuting people for for a little bit now yes he even reads him his last rites you know i he reads from the Bible and he's as that's the part was eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, burning for burning, and that's when they flip the switch. Or B- Barry does. Because Barry does all the hard. I, I love what Tubbs way to try and talk his way out of this. You shouldn't be killing these people. You need to be killing like politicians and judges. <laughs> like they're the real criminals. Let's go find them and murder them. <laughs> Tubbs, Just he's... saying, Governor of Miami, you might want to watch yourself. Tubbs is uh he, he's sicking this cult guy on you. <laughs> Tub sees his only chance for escape here, and that's to flip it, make him think that Tubbs is on his side. That's his only way he's going to be. It. That oh, way yeah. he doesn't have to spend all his time locked up in that cell. So when Tubbs starts to pitch this idea that, hey, me and you can be best friends because we both enjoy taking the law into our own hands and want to punish the people who have wrong society it's like a scene out of Step Brothers where jake is like do we just become best friends and tubbs is like yep and then tubbs starts saying maybe we shouldn't let these people go let's go after the big ones like you're saying trying to go after the, the corrupt b- businessmen and politicians let's let them all go and jake's like i don't know i mean i got that whore and i've been holding on to her for some time i mean she's quite a collectible i don't know if i could just let that one go then tubbs goes out of his way to convince jake that you don't understand she's faking it she's not actually a whore she's pure she's just faking it because she's so young she doesn't know what to do she's just it's she's not actually that way she's really pure on the inside jake likes what he's hearing very much they escort Tubbs to her cell she asks if he's gonna hurt her and Tubbs says no we're gonna make you look like a virgin we're gonna make you look pure she doesn't understand what's happening she thinks like it's just the kink that she needs to fulfill but Tubbs like no no you don't understand remember you are yeah pure. she's like she's like like oh version fantasies like oh that's those are my specialty like i've got <laughs> this no worries i'll take care of it. i felt bad for leon spinks at the beginning <laughs> at this point he's just an accomplice 
<laughs> I mean, why is he still going along with this crap? Does he pay that well? I don't know what the deal is. He's got him brainwashed really good, and he's got and Chubb's going to ask him about that later too. That's why he's wearing that outfit. Otherwise, I mean, <laughs> that weird shirt and necklace and everything. He's got his own ceremonial garb too. <laughs> At the precinct in Castillo's office, hangs up the phone and tells Gina that the prison psychiatrist that went missing, she was the one that was taking care of Jake. Trudy comes in and says that the address that from Phelps is just an empty apartment. So Castillo says, "Go stake out Phelps." Back at Jake's, Tubbs is cleaning up the woman who's going to be known as Anna. Now, because that's what he calls, that's what Jake calls her later. Like, she's like my Anna. Yeah. Whatever that Whoever is. that is, yeah. <laughs> They're back in the parlor. Jake is looking her over. Tubbs is saying, remember, looks can be deceiving. I told you she's all good. And Jake, you see his eyes, like his eyes bugging out of his head. And he's just drooling all over himself now for Anna. Barry tries to say, she's just a whore. And Jake smacks him right in the face. Blammo! <laughs> How dare you judge another person's soul? You're just a punch drunk fighter, Barry. Yeah, why I do mean, you keep taking it? Just kill them all, Barry. It's okay. We're here for you, man. Just, just take that them all out. Hurt. It's God's will. That one hurt Barry on the inside and the outside. <laughs> <laughs> Barry's got a tender heart, that Barry, but not quite that much brains. But <laughs> Barry's gonna go mine the boats now. <laughs> yeah. Jake is absolutely fixated on Anna. He's very excited very impressed he says i want to take her to my bedroom you all stay here yeah i mean that was the mistake right there tub should not let that happen <laughs> and it can't keep the charade up that she's a virgin very well apparently which is why tub should have he could have distracted him with a back rub <laughs> tub is in there i'm a virgin <laughs> i also am a virgin <laughs> quick scene at phelps he's on the phone with castillo he says sorry i don't have another address for jake i can't help you back at jake's tubbs is talking to barry and this is when he's saying how can a real friend treat you that way he slapped you right in the face <laughs> how do you still follow his <laughs> stuff <laughs> real friends don't treat you this way <laughs> like i bet you he never lets you do anything and barry goes yeah you're right he never does let me do anything he is pretty overbearing <laughs> on me and then Blammo, Tubbs hits him with like a piece of steel that was just sitting on top of a switchboard. Oh, even steel lying around. <laughs> so Tubbs was just using him. He was also treating him like trash. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't care about your feelings. It's all a charade. Kablammo punches him in the face and takes his gun. Hit him like that. Now I get why he's not absurd anymore. Like, <laughs> the glass jaw must have got him. Like. <laughs> Well, he, wasn't, punch better than that. he wasn't a successful boxer because he kept getting knocked out really easy. <laughs> uh -huh. I mean, he didn't even see that slap coming from that old man. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> he was stuck. <laughs> Poor Barry. <laughs> Back at Phelps, they, the ladies see Phelps come downstairs, but he makes them really fast. And so then there becomes like a little foot chase, but Gina's able to see him drive away. She radios to Stan. Did he, did he really run away very fast? Or is high heels not the best for chasing? <laughs> I don't know. We've seen Gina chase someone down in high heels before. So I don't think he was running very fast. <laughs> Back at Jake's in his bedroom is when he's talking to Anna. And he's asking her, when did you go down this dark path? And this is more like how dark this episode is. And she says, my dad, he made me do really awful things when I was a kid. Back in the parlor, and I got ahead of myself, this is when Tubbs Kablamo punches out <laughs> Barry. But in the room, mm -hmm. Anna says that she wishes she was a kid again because that's when she was happy. She's not happy anymore. So Jake gets down on his knees, starts rubbing her feet and says, do you like that? Then he slides his hands up a little bit further underneath her dress and says, do you like that? And she's like, I guess. I don't know. I, I don't think she knew what she was supposed to say. So she mm -hmm. was like, oh, uh, yeah, kind well, of. Downstairs, Tubbs has the keys and he's releasing all the prisoners. He tells Eddie, quick, boy, go run for help. Boy. <laughs> Tell him I fell down the well. <laughs> <laughs> run, you chump. <laughs> he gets the psychiatrist out who's like, super chill cool let's just go for it upstairs bro like who want to go with them to go bring down and go save anna and go bring down jake but when they get up there tubbs has to wrestle with barry and he drops the gun and that's when jake comes out he picks up the gun and says foolish tubbs you should have just left and then blammo you remember <laughs> that barry is a boxer and he knocks tubbs out <laughs> 
Rico's plan of escape foiled by an uppercut. Rico wakes up later. He's in his cell. The dead body of Anna is there now, too. So then he realizes he made a terrible mistake, and he should have never trusted that dumb bimbo to go in there by herself. <laughs> <laughs> he said, "You have to be a virgin. You have to pretend like you're a virgin. A virgin wouldn't like to have her feet rubbed by some old man." Okay. <laughs> later, Jake is walking and talking with Tubbs. He put his handcuffed now. Tubbs says, "It's too late, man. You're caught." Eddie's gone. So, He's going to go tell the cops. So how later do you this is? Like three weeks later? Like a <laughs> month later? It's all the, It's got to be all the same night. It's like all within a couple days of each other. I was, it's got to be at least a couple days because you're not even missing until 24 hours. So Well, they say that Tubbs like, hasn't been seen in two days or something. Like in the very beginning. Like we haven't seen, he hasn't been to work. He hasn't been here like for two days. So. Okay, so we're probably at about the weak point now. So, like, they, they've stopped doing stuff to him at night, you know. And, <laughs> and now, like, he's free to roam the complex as long as he doesn't take his collar off. <laughs> Rico says the clock is ticking, but Jake's like, I'm way ahead of you, man. He turns on a light, and there's Eddie dead. Like, I didn't want to kill him, but Barry said we had to. So, here he is. Barry's like, what? <laughs> there's all your hopes right there, dead inside of this chair. And then, this is when the bombshell happens, is that Jake is telling... Tubbs, I want you to feel how I feel. So therefore, we're going to kill the psychiatrist and you are going to flip the switch. Translation. Why won't you love me, Rico? I wish I could quit you. <laughs> they put Rico inside of the psychiatrist's cell and she's like, hey man, what's up? And then that's when she finally breaks down. It's like, oh my god, I'm next. Please help me. And she breaks down Tubbs, crying. She literally, so she's like, what's up? And Tubbs go, Tubbs literally says, I'm not going to let anything happen to you. He immediately starts freaking out. Like, like, <laughs> I, she'd be like, oh my God, he's lying. <laughs> Maybe she's heard about how they protect people. She got wind of it. <laughs> she's like, uh-uh, I've heard about you people. <laughs> At the docks, Stan is watching Phelps. He watches them get onto a boat, but Stan can't follow. He doesn't have a boat. But he he's pretty defeated. Right away, he's like, we got in a boat, so that's it. <laughs> What do I do now? Like, go home or what? Like, I got one got away. Wait for me. Because <laughs> he was like, wait there and I'll get Only a boat could... and I'll meet you. <laughs> That's a good idea. I did not think of that. Castillo says, go talk to the person that he got the boat from, find out where he was going. Or, you know, like, take over the boat. I mean, Jump in the boat. Like, he could have got in the back of the boat what with would the guy. Sonny do? He would have jumped in the boat. and it's What Sonny would do is a boat. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But <laughs> Yes, very true. So now we're back at Jake's and we're for the final scene of the episode. Mary escorts Tubbs and the psychiatrist down to the electric chair. Jake is there. Tubbs says, you don't have to do this, man. Jake <laughs> says, I'm not. You are. So I mean, well, touche. <laughs> but... You're going you're gonna to cook her good. <laughs> Phelps comes running up to the door, starts banging on it, trying to get in, triggers the alarm. And so now Jake's got to go upstairs and go talk to Phelps. He brings Barry with him. They lock everyone inside of the execution room. Tubbs says, hopefully my Mr. Wizard electric electricity knowledge is up to par because he dropped some loose change into one of the switches to sabotage it isn't didn't he take night classes for this though isn't it what oh, he took shit, he did <laughs> remember oh my god yeah, the that night school like is coming two. in handy yeah no it wasn't season two isn't it like that's god said well, that's the send money one the oh yeah 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 that's right so season four the first episode yeah. of season four he says that he's been taking classes because he's not going to be a cop forever. He wants to get in, maybe do be an electrician. Yes. See? Oh, my God. Those classes paid off. Mr. Oh. Wizard was his teacher. <laughs> that was his professor's uh. name. Not that he was lying. He never took classes. Wow. He just watched Mr. Wizard. <laughs> No, I'm a good catch. I never thought about his night school experience. Like, that comes <laughs> so handy here. <laughs> Thank God Phelps showed up looking the party. Upstairs, Jake is in his best white robes. Because yes. it's a big event. <laughs> and Phelps is like, what the hell are you yeah. wearing? <laughs> Phelps when goes... All over, they drink the Kool-Aid. And then everything's... <laughs> Phelps goes, so what are you up to, bro? <laughs> If Jake says, I'm fulfilling our mission. We have so much more that we have to do. So no more lessons teach. And Phelps says, how about you show me what you got going on? Yeah, I Phelps gets panicky. He's like, what? Like, he goes, what do you mean? Like, no, that wasn't real. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. Oh, that's what you're doing. 
<laughs> oh, like, can oh, I man, see like what you're doing? Drunk. <laughs> <laughs> he just came over because he's he wants to know where the cop is. He yeah. says that guy Tubbs came over here. Is he still here? Because the cops are fucking me. They said he can't find him. They haven't checked in. And, and Jake says, Yeah, he's still here. They all say the night after the party. And Phelps like, Oh, sweet. Okay, we well, can I talk back. to him? Yeah. Oh no, I can't do that. No. I'll ruin everything that I'm doing. He's like, What do you mean? What are you doing? <laughs> he's in the sex dungeon and he hasn't said the safe word yet. You can't see him until he says the safe word. He's really surprised that this turned out this way. That Jake turned out to be a sociopath. <laughs> <laughs> they go downstairs and Tubbs he's surprised but, uh, jake pretty pissed off like, i thought you were cool phelps like <laughs> what the hell because yeah, they go downstairs and they see Tubbs strapping the psychiatrist into the electric chair that's a lot of trust i uh, know that's a lot uh, of trust she was trusting that night school paid off <laughs> he tells her i yeah, took a she... class don't worry i got you covered <laughs> It was only two nights, uh, but I took it. I paid attention. I took notes and everything. <laughs> it was a weekend seminar at the Hilton. Came with free coffee. <laughs> exactly. I thought that too. I was like, isn't there another way? Like, couldn't they have used this time to do something else? Not strap her in, but still break the Pull machine. Pull wire out like, or something. Know. I don't know. Stall it. Trust in a penny inside <laughs> of a switch. <laughs> this is just a weird situation to begin with. Now we've got a movie producer. We've got Manning in his white robes, ready to drink the Kool-Aid. Barry, for unknown reason at this point, is going along with everything and getting ready to throw the switch. And Tubbs, even though this entire time he's been fighting man Manning on this, now he's just hooking up the psychiatrist like, do, 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 do. oh, don't forget this clamp. <laughs> Jake is mad at Phelps and says, you're just like them. You're profiting off of death and sadness. So now I want you to flip the switch. Tubbs starts yelling it to him. Tubbs pushing that piece over the psychiatrist's head on the electric chair, yelling to him, don't do it. Make Jake do his own murder. <laughs> yeah. Excuse Hello, me. Excuse me. <laughs> Phelps collapses and says he can't do it. So then Barry goes over to flip the switch while Jake has him at gunpoint. Barry flips it, electrocutes him. Thank you, Mr. Wizard. And those <laughs> night school classes, Tubbs tackles Jake, but Jake's able to fight him off and run up the stairs. When he gets up to the top of the stairs, he runs out into the backyard by the pool. Stan and Castillo are there. Tubbs catches up with them. He's under arrest. He stops. Course. He puts his hands up. And it's just slow oh, you know, moving get, scene. Just just say it. He's not going to go back to prison. He's never going to go back to prison. He was never going to go back to prison. This was always going to end one way. Well, two ways. It was either going to end with him and Tubbs making passionate love or with <laughs> Tubbs killing him. One of the two ways. He was never going to go to jail. And... I only wish, like, maybe someone on the vice team had a taser or something. No, they're going to shoot him. Or a dart yeah. gun. If Sonny had been there, he'd be dead already. <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, but I'm disappointed. Unfortunately, the taser and the dart gun are downstairs in the <laughs> sex dungeon. Exactly. I'm disappointed in Tubbs that he couldn't take an old man out down th when in the downstairs when he's, like, wrestling with him. How did he get away? He's an old man. He's frail. Come on, Tubbs. <laughs> there were multiple scenes where Tubbs was not handcuffed or restricted in exactly. any way. And they were just sitting there talking. I think he liked it. <laughs> it's just, I never got the, that Tubbs didn't want to be there. Jake goes like he's going to his waist, like he's going to pull a gun. Whole team fires at him. He goes down. Tubbs comes over, stands over him in, in, in Jake's final moments. And Jake says, you've finally done it. I have never once been I love free. You, Tubbs. And then he dies. And then we freeze frame. And that's the end of the episode. So far as like anticlimactic that Jake's death is at the end of this episode and how much we wanted him to be captured again, the reform point gets really hammered here at the very end. Because he says at the end, Tubbs asks him, why did you do this? Why did you set yourself up? And that's when he says, I've never been free. Just hammers home that point of no one can be reformed. Counterpoint. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, I mean, what if I think no one um, can be reformed? So <laughs> I'm pretty much, uh, yeah, I know. That's why prison's a bad place to go. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, is he's not that. Is he's a good guy. We like him. <laughs> this episode took some turns i was not prepared for and i kind of read ahead on what this episode was and boy howdy did we take a different path that i thought we were going down what did you think was gonna happen 
<laughs> now I'm worried. Did you think this was going to be like sweaty time tubs? Yeah, and yeah. Like, no, I thought he was just going to be held hostage, like AKA m- misery, but oh, vice gotcha. style. I thought that's what was going to happen. It was going to be this form, this person he had arrested that had him under lock and key. I also expected a lot more mannequins or dolls because we have a, a psycho here and that's how vice does it, but we didn't have any in this one. He didn't have any. They were, they ran out of dolls. <laughs> Let's get off this dark topic. Everyone, shake it out. Okay, shake it out. Good. Let's go talk about this week's music, which is an amazing musician. No matter what John says, let's go talk about this week's music. John, I am the most excited for this musical guest. I mean, this is probably the second most excited I've been for a music guest. The number one is Phil Collins. I cannot wait to hear about this one. What do you got for us this week? You know, I can't help you. There was no music. It's amazing. (laughs) No music. No. Okay. There was music. Vice is going to make me think about Yanni. (laughs) Yanni, whose real name is Giannis. (laughs) Sorry. Here's the (laughs) Mollus. Giannis. 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 Short for Giannis. I t- I when you said Giannis, I was totally expecting you to be like Giannis McYanni. <laughs> <laughs> so his song Keys to Imagination off the album Keys to Imagination. Um <laughs> <laughs> Such little imagination. Yanni is a Greek composer, keyboardist, pianist, and music producer. He's known for blending jazz, classical, soft rock, and world music in predominantly instrumental creations or works. He's, he has at least 16 albums that have peaked at number one on the Billboard Top New Age. We're going to come back to that. He has two albums, Dare to Dream and In My Time, that both got Grammy nominations. Lots of success for music without words. <laughs> Says the person who loves blues. Yeah. I love blues. I love jazz. Um, we, we, we Don't worry. We're going to talk about it. We'll get to it. Okay. So some of the feats that Yanni has done. He's performed in over 30 countries. He's performed at numerous historical sites, including the Taj Mahal, the Great Sphinx of Giza, and a bunch of others. He's used that as like concert tours. He will do a big ass concert at like the Taj Mahal. And you know, they don't let like everybody just play at the Taj Mahal. One of the few people to play there, they'll film it and then they'll sell the DVDs. And because of that, he has over 40 platinum or gold albums, sales totaling over $25 million. So my question to you guys, I never met anybody who has ever paid money for a Yanni CD. <laughs> you or anyone you know ever paid money for a Yanni CD? Because I have a theory here. I do. I have one person that I know. It was a um, ex-girlfriend, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah. outing myself. <laughs> a high school girlfriend of mine, her parents loved yanni and um mm. i would go over to their house all the time and they would there'd be like a yanni concert on tv and she the the mom in particular really loved yanni and so i became quite familiar with yanni while being over at that house and she paid real money for it and i thought it was quite hilarious <laughs> hilarious <laughs> what about you melissa yes, when that I was have, a yanni fan i have an aunt that likes yanni my aunt christina likes yanni Whoa, curveball. Okay. Because he dated, because who he dated. She liked Dynasty. And so mm. and he dated Linda Gray. And but, so. But that doesn't. Did she actually own any of the music or did she just like that guy that Linda Evans dated? No, I think she owned, <laughs> I think she owned his music because, she, I mean, I don't know who bought it for her, but she had it. She did have a CD or whatever at the yeah, time. And so the, we're, we're not 100%. So we've got two people out of everybody we know, and one of them. Could have bought it, but might not have. <laughs> might, okay. He might have got it as a gift. Dude, how many first... elevators? <laughs> how many elevators do you think there are in the United States? <laughs> One hundred seven thousand. We have no way uh, to yeah. verify that. <laughs> <laughs> At least, if not way more than that, okay. So if we're talking, the last time I heard Johnny was either in an elevator or a mall or an office building. <laughs> so if we add up every mall office building or elevator mm. that, that's a lot of cd sales right there solid point solid point you think about how that many might just total over. 25 million dollars 
mm-hmm. and maybe get you 40 number gold albums. You know, and so I, I've got to be honest, that might total $24 million. And then a million dollars of people like your your ex-girlfriend's mom who yeah. actually were dumb enough to pay. <laughs> There's a solid point on that. Like for business use and how much in sales that that shit generates, because there's some feeling in the streaming, like the Netflix world now, that there's a bunch of shows that are being kept alive, and they just see like how many times it's being streamed. But it's because a doctor's office is playing the same Turbo episode a thousand times a day, and so it makes mm-hmm. it out of whack. Like like for music, they're listening to Spotify, and they listen to like this office safe playlist. And it's getting all these streams, but no one's actually paying attention to it. Very true. And I know how many mm-hmm. elevators are operating in the United States. I just looked it up. <laughs> 900,000 oh, yeah. elevators Damn. operating in the United States right now. So if every See? if every building had it, that has an elevator has a copy of Yanni, that's almost makes it platinum. Exactly. Exactly. See? And to support that even more, his music has been used in a crap load of commercials for sporting events like the Super Bowl and the Olympics, as well as award shows. Do any of you guys remember Yanni performing at an award show? No, because he didn't perform at an (laughs) award show because they played his music when they wanted the person accepting the award to shut up and get off stage. (laughs) Just to defend my my ex-girlfriend's mom, just to put it in perspective, uh, I should say. Maybe you should back your... (laughs) The perspective, I, say. I think I've just proven that Yanni's made up of selling CDs to <laughs> dentist office. Yeah, I think so. She also owned like every chicken soup for the soul book and had a Beanie Baby collection and could do the Macarena. <laughs> so if you just take everything in the 90s and just roll it up into one old person, <laughs> like the late 30s, <laughs> early 40s person in the 90s, that's her. That might be the whitest person I've ever heard of. <laughs> Beanie Babies, Chicken Soup for the Soul, and Yanni. She buys her mayonnaise at Costco. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just one of the big tubs, which is the spout on it. That you just... Oh, God. <laughs> Gross. All right, all right. Getting back to Giannis. Giannis was a gifted child, picked up piano by the age of six, and is said to be self-taught. Uh, he actually even to this day, uses his own shorthand rather than tra- traditional music notation. So what that tells me is that Yanni can't actually read music, and he has some made-up symbols he uses. <laughs> he had to make up which would be, it. it must be super hard to be in, like, Yanni's band. It's like, like heart stars are great. Are, are these lucky charm symbols? What the hell am I supposed <laughs> to play, Yanni? Okay. Uh, by the way, not only a talented mist as a child, at the age of 14, he set a Greek national record in the 50-meter freestyle swimming competition, which I guess there's just one Greece, and if a 14-year-old can win it, I don't think that they're very good at it. <laughs> and by 1972, when he was about 18 years old, he moved to the U.S. And of all places in the U.S., he moved to Minnesota to to attend the University of Minnesota. <laughs> in 1973, he was majoring in psychology. He'd actually re- receive a bachelor's associate in psychology in 1976 from the University of Minnesota. Rather than use his bachelor's in psychology, in 77, he would join a rock band called Chameleon. Now, Chameleon would, would tour, and uh, at the same time, as he would tour with Camille, he would also contribute to the Minnesota Dance Theater. Uh, he'd provide music for them, and they would, in turn, tour with them, with Chameleon. And this would be into the early 80s. Most of all, he would meet drummer Charlie Adams, who was the founder of Chameleon. And that would be important because Charlie Adams would be his drummer until at least 2010. Mm. Like They would continue working together. And this is when Yanni started to posse up. So we're getting into the 80s. Yanni decides, I'm going to move to L.A. and I'm going to pursue movie soundtracks. He would do his first, record his first couple albums with Atlantic. And by the late 80s, 87, he would form a band with fellow pianist, singer, and local DJ, John Tesh, everybody. <gasps> Ooh. It mer- the merging. Oh my god! Yes, and so we would have a band: John Tesh, Yanni, and Charlie Adams on drums. 
and they would begin touring in 1988 and releasing albums, including Keys to Imagination. <laughs> Other than Keys to Imagination, the least imaginative uh, album name, <laughs> he, they, they would also release Out of Silence and Chameleon Days. And during this time, Yanni would start his career writing soundtracks for movies. I'm going to name you all, all these different movies because it was like, all these are like within two years of each other. He wrote the soundtracks to all these movies. You tell me which is your favorite. Steal the Sky in 1988. Heart of Madness in 88. I Love You Perfectly in 89. She'll Take Romance in 90. When You Remember Me 90. As well as Children of the Bride in 90. And then in 94, Howa Q. Shaolin is the oddball <laughs> of the group. <laughs> well, I don't know, John. It's really hard to say because I really appreciate all Hallmark Channel movies. And it's hard for me to choose just one. <laughs> so I just have to say, I hope that all those women found what they were looking for. <laughs> I will say you are pretty damn close because I, I, I literally looked at a couple of these movies. And yeah, they're pretty much like straight to, to, straight to VHS or Betamax or whatever was going on at that time. <laughs> What was the name of that channel, huh? Melissa, before the Hallmark Channel? What was the one that showed all those movies and stuff? Which, not, I don't not know. We... Lifetime. Yeah, Lifetime. That's what I was trying to think yeah, of. Yeah, Lifetime. Sh they still make Christmas movies. For the they record. They still exist. In fact, uh, the Lifetime and the Hallmark Channel are, are responsible for the uh, Property Brothers acting career. Oh, my God. <laughs> Believe it or not, they've done like 10 Hallmark movies oh, in a God, few Lifetimes. That's terrible. Oh, Which yeah. is worse, a Property Brothers movie oh, yeah. or a WWE movie? Oh, God. I I'm, I don't know. That's hey. pretty bad. I think Property Brothers. <laughs> Guys. Oh, oh no. Uh, I would I would totally want to see a Property Brothers movie because Jonathan is a former magician, <laughs> like legitimately, like he did that for a living. I'm, I'm scared. He, was, at he how did much magic you know about before he started Brothers. acting. John, I'm worried about you. How, how, why do you know so hey, much about Property Brothers? I have to do Brothers? something to keep me awake in between researching Yanni. Okay. <laughs> Oh, the Property Brothers are more interesting than Yanni, okay? <laughs> All right, let, let, let's get to the end of this Yanni stuff, okay? So by the 90s, he's making crappy movie soundtracks. He's touring with John Tesh. He's making crappy music, selling, basically. <laughs> he's selling millions upon millions of albums to dentist office and shopping malls everywhere. How could life get any better? He was in People magazine in 1990. He showed up on Oprah with his girlfriend, Linda Evans. But apparently, people didn't know she was crazy at that point. The power of Ramtha, John. Do not underestimate not, the power of Ramtha. She's not in Ramtha. <laughs> she's got her own I'm not entirely that Yanni wasn't murdered in 92 and uh, replaced by Ramtha. So... They shoot apples off his head. <laughs> <laughs> for, for anyone so who's wondering, the, for anyone who's wondering what the hell we're talking about, there's a religion. Religion. They're they're interesting people. They 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 practice romta. So wrap everything up. So and by the way, guys, like when you're reading, and I'm reading his Wikipedia page, and the person who who was writing it actually made a point to say like. He, he was at his height of popularity showing up in People magazine and on Oprah with lit his girlfriend, Linda Evans, at the time. But people still mostly knew him as that guy that's dating Linda Evans. Like, no one really <laughs> knew him as, like, Yanni the mu mu musician. Like, he was just, hey, that's the guy that's dating Linda Evans. <laughs> from then, from the 90s through the 2000s, he has just released a crap ton of albums. And like I said... He's doing this thing where he does these concerts at these big venues. He'll film it, um, and he releases them. He's huge on PBS. Like, he releases a ton of his concerts on public broadcast television. But he's also a big supporter. So, but just made millions and millions and millions of dollars off of elevators. It's amazing. <laughs> and apparently, he's the reason why John Tesh exists. And so, I hate him a little <laughs> bit more, just knowing that. Well, I don't um, know if we should be happy about that. So yeah, there, there you go. There, there's Giannis for you, John. I was so looking forward to this music segment for two reasons. One, that that Vice was going to force you to learn everything about Yanni. I know you love music, and Yanni was the absolute lowest person on your 
to-do list to ever learn everything about, and I really appreciate the advice forced you to learn about Yanni. Two, I only knew from Yanni, all I ever knew was like my ex-girlfriend's mom who watched him perform at the Acropolis a bunch of times, so I've seen that tape a bunch of times. And that David Tell joke where he says that he doesn't trust Yanni because he didn't trust anyone who looks like a magician that doesn't do magic. <laughs> <laughs> Which is See, Yanni. another reason, another reason why Jonathan from the Property Brothers is more interesting than Yanni. All right, let's get off this Yanni nonsense. So let's go talk about our final thoughts on this episode. All right, all right. I'm going to kick off our final thoughts here. That normally means I have a hot take. <laughs> My hot take on this one is to defend this episode. I'm not saying that you guys are going to badmouth it. I'm just saying like this I, I, this episode hit me a little harder than I was anticipating. We got off of a really bad episode last week, so I had really low expectations for what this episode was going to be, especially when I knew it was going to be a Tubbs exclusive episode. So that means the rest of Ice Team is going to be non-existent. They appeared a little bit in this episode, but still, we don't really get full buy-in from the team. I really like this episode because of the dark topics that they were willing to cover specifically on network TV. That is a huge risk that they're taking. As cable is starting out, not really a thing, back in 1989, this was a big deal to talk about these topics. Prostitution, cults, uh, murder for hire, uh, ref- prison reform like these things these are really heavy topics i'm going to be talking about on network tv and the things that they're talking about inside of them like anna talking about her dad made her do very awful things and then the progression of that scene it is very dark and is very heavy and covers some very very heavy topics in there and what i appreciate about it and it's it's not necessarily this episode, but it's Vice in general. What I appreciate about Vice is that they are willing to talk about those things. And that parents who or people that have done terrible things to children, and particularly parents who have done things to their own children, that is a not a common, but a frequent thing that Vice is willing to talk about. And not hide that that is a thing and a challenge that law enforcement has to deal with. I do appreciate Vice's effort into ta- having the message for reform for prison. And can a person be reborn while in prison after paying their debt to society? I happen to believe that that is true. I very strongly believe that that is true and that people are able to become reformed. But that's that's not what this podcast is about. So although I disagree with what the message is here, I appreciate that Vice had an opinion, talked about it and delivered it and made you think about it. And sometimes those conversations, like what modern shows do, is they make you they make something from a perspective that makes you feel uncomfortable in your own skin. It makes you question your own opinions. And that's what this episode does well. John, what are your final thoughts? I'm not going to get into so so much deep stuff as you. I will say that this episode this episode was interesting. It's kind of uh kind of back and forth on it. I'm not I haven't I haven't settled as far as whether or not I think it's a good episode or not. At times it felt kind of like after school special where he's kind of taking him around the dungeon like this is Joey. Joey's a crackhead. <laughs> and you almost see like Tubbs is like the kid in the after school special. Well, why, Mr. Manning? Why is Joe a crackhead? You know. Um, what kind of after school special did you watch? <laughs> not our fault, Melissa. We grew up in Central Valley of California where all the meth is made. True. Very true. Yeah. I appreciate the message they're getting and, and everything. I thought it was a little goofy that they're holding Tubbs hostage in this sex dungeon. And I am not going to back off on the fact that this was clearly a date. And that at one point, like Tubbs was get, was Tubbs and Jake were uh, might have thrown down. I do appreciate the ladies getting an appearance and getting some speaking words in this episode, which was nice. <laughs> Ultimately, and I think what's going to push me over the edge as far as this being a bad episode or a good episode is the fact that I had to learn about Yanni. <laughs> and I may love blues and I may love jazz. I, I, I love like Chet Baker jazz, you know, Miles Davis jazz. Y- Yanni's like synthesized soft rock, like the easy listening station that you turn on, like dentist music you hear at the dentist office. I hate you, Vice. I hate you. <laughs> Melissa, what are your final thoughts? Well, I don't have a strong opinion as you do. 
I mean, I think this is a, is a decent episode for not having everybody in it. I wish, like, I like you guys have touched on. I do wish they had everybody in it. I wish that they had actual real parts to play, not like, "Hey, we're here. Look at us. Like, wave your arms around. I'm here. I'm, we're still here. We're okay. We're still part of the team, even though we haven't really had anything to do." The, the ladies have been sorely missed this whole season, and this is just another episode where they are underutilized. But I do, I do appreciate that they are actually in the episode. Of course, it would have been better if Crockett was there. Because, you know, if Tubbs, if, it was, if the roles were reversed and Crockett was kidnapped in a sexy dungeon, I think that Tubbs would have cut his, his fishing trip short. <laughs> to, to <shame>. <laughs> and he would have showed up. But hey, you know, what do I know about being best friends? Maybe I don't understand that how that Crockett works. Crockett doesn't get a whole lot of time with little Donnie. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That is true. I mean, like I said, like we've touched on it. It touched on some taboo subjects, which I think Vice has always done well, that they've always been able to be like, this is what's going on and we're going to talk about it. And it makes you uncomfortable. And we're going to show things that you don't may not necessarily want to see in the 80s or your parent. Like I wasn't allowed to watch the show. I would sneakily watch it in my room on my TV and be like, I'm not supposed to watch this. And my parents would come in, I'd turn it off. So, <laughs> so I know what it's like to watch the taboo stuff and be like, okay. And that's what Vice did good. And I think this, I thought it was a good episode. Like, like I said, I wish it had more interaction with everybody else. But he was, if we're talking about like, we like episodes with bad guys who are bad. He was a bad guy and he was creepy. Mm-hmm. He was really creepy. He, uh, he really portrayed himself as being like a, he was a creeper. <laughs> he was like a pedophile or something. Man, he really liked feet. That was weird. <laughs> <laughs> All that prison, I guess. I don't know. And that's going to do it for us this week on Go With The Heat. We hope you enjoyed this episode. We would love to hear from you. Email us, GoWithTheHeat at gmail.com. Get us on Twitter at Go With The Heat. Get us on Instagram at Go With The Heat. Get us on Facebook at Go With The Heat. You know how to get a hold of us. We would love to hear from you. Contact us in any of those ways or more because you can find us on even more places like Tumblr. Well, I don't know about Tumblr. They got that porno band now. So I'm gonna have to <laughs> we might not be down. there. <laughs> <laughs> we would love to hear your feedback. Let us know what your thoughts are on this episode. In specific, we want to hear about my take on prison reform and if this was a topic that uh, you took out of this episode too. Did you have come out of there or, with a strong feeling about it or you could tell us your favorite morgan j freeman movie <laughs> <laughs> be sure to check out that website go at the heat.com you can find all the ways to contact us you can find all the ways to support us support step number one contact us email us go with you to gmail.com support step number two go to your podcast your platform of choice and leave us a review now pals i'm going to ask something extra special this week we did get a review on itunes and it's it was a a um a Good feedback. We understand that sometimes our show isn't what a Vice fan is looking for because we like to have a little bit of fun, and sometimes that's at Vice's expense. And I can, I totally appreciate the person that was willing to write a review and say, "Hey, I was excited to see that there was a show that was going to talk about Vice, but they're a little too light, poking fun at the show." I totally understand that. I totally appreciate them, but Palace, I want your help. Right now, we have a two star rating on iTunes. We need you to go to iTunes and go give us a five-star review and bury that two-star review for us. Raise yes. that, that review star rating up. It helps us. to help us out big time. Consider it a Christmas gift to your pals at the Go With The Heat podcast. Go over there. Give us five stars. Support step number three. Check out that Patreon. Patreon.com slash Go With The Heat. Find all the ways that you can get early access. You can get a custom newsletter, even a fake mustache, a business card, and a skinny tie because at a certain level you become our Castillo. That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode and we'll see you all next time. Bye, pal.